and good morning, good evening, or wherever the time zone may be, wherever you are in the world. I am Commander Yannick, and we are here in Elite Dangerous. And we have one very particular reason. Today is April the 12th of the year 2021, some 60 years since Yuri Gagarin became the first human being to enter the realm of space. Now, we've got out, well, just over half an hour before that actually happens, but with a lot of these sort of historical events, if I can mark them in real time, though it, whatever anniversary, in this case 60 years in the past real time, I will do so. And, uh, here we are, as you can see, in orbit of the planet Earth in the Sol system. The wonderful job that Frontier have done in making a pretty accurate representation of Earth, I think. Yeah, you can down there see where my nose is pointing towards the Red Sea, towards the I was going to say the Sinai Peninsula down there to the Mediterranean, Turkey, the Black Sea, and into where we're looking at the moment, where the nose is pointing deep into what was once known as the Soviet Union. That vast territory comprising of so many different time zones across the world. Arguably an almost transglobal country in its era. Uh, these days, Russia is uh, almost as large, but not quite making up the bulk of what was the land area of the former Soviet Union. But back in the day, when our old chum Yuri was launching into space, as in all the other cosmonauts that went after him, he'd be launching from Baikonur in Kazakhstan. This is always the funny part though, isn't it? Because even though it say Baikonur, it technically was Chura town, but Baikonur was like the nearest major town and sort of railway uh, station really and that's how they got a lot of the booster components from the various places in the USSR to uh, then Kazakhstan being the Kazakhstan SSR a part of the USSR obviously now an independent nation and has an arrangement with Russia to still host the Baikonur Cosmodrome Baikonur Spaceport but all those years ago this was this was a new thing i mean space exploration had not been tried for a human being whatsoever I mean, the best thing that could have sort of approximated was uh for the americans monkeys to be sent into uh early test flights and in the case of the soviet union it was dogs an interesting preference in both cases i think for the soviets it's kind of it seems more kind of straightforward in a way, just that dogs are easy to get hold of and as uh, sort of test subjects. And uh, But I suppose the advantage, on the other hand, of using chimps was for the Americans is that their physiognomy is, physiology is nearer to that of a human being, so it was easier to measure their stress and possibly distress as well, actually, in some cases, and uh, to see how their physiology would react to zero-g, because this was... In this period of research, it was the late 1950s, early 1960s, and very little, close to nothing, was known about how a human would react physically, psychologically, to space travel. It was something that only by, say, animal experimentation, unethical, especially by today's standards, it uh, was sort of one of the pointers. I mean... The one thing the only I can say with the upshot of some of those early animal flights is that I think there was only actually one animal flight fatality, and that was the first one. Uh, that was Laika, the first creature to ever go into space. And unfortunately, Laika never made it back from uh, her mission, but fortunately she was never intended to. I don't think that was part of the the deal when the Soviets sent her up. But all the, the subsequent uh, dog flights... Um, were actually all successful, I think, and they they all returned the creatures um, safe and sound back to Earth. And most of them, I think all of them, were in excellent condition, in excellent health. Uh, there's the famous story, I think, of one of these sort of early space dogs uh, testing a Vostok capsule 
was actually given puppies of the said dog were given as a present by uh, the Soviet leader Khrushchev to uh, the Kennedy family. I think when he made a, a visit to the U.S. Uh, in the early 1960s. So there's an interesting piece of uh, space trivia for you. Evidently the creatures must have been unharmed, otherwise they couldn't have had puppies, so yeah, in that way. But that was one of the early fears of space travel, that radiation might actually make it impossible for people to enter space, or any creature for that matter. But those fears proved unfounded. I mean, space does have radiation, it's true, but it's something you have to offset against the uh, potential benefits and try and give yourself enough shielding as well. But, uh, yeah, back to the early 60s and very 1961 in particular and our old friend uh, Yuri Gagarin now Yuri was arguably the leading member of the first uh, group of astronauts from the Soviet Union the so called first uh, Air Force group which was actually very large I think of about uh, 20 astronauts cosmonauts and uh, this is in comparison to the equivalent group in America, the Mercury 7, which obviously is a small number, seven people. But either way, there was a lot of famous astronauts that uh, came from that first group. People like Gagarin, Titov, Lyanov, and several others who became those early sort of Soviet pioneers of a space flight. Obviously, uh, Gagarin, first man in space, I think. Um, and then... I think the, was it Titov set the various endurance records next, and then eventually Lyanov became the first man to walk in space, all from that same group. And I'm missing out on quite a few other sort of starred cosmonauts here, but that's not really uh, their day. This uh, this one belongs to Gagarin and him alone. But the whole race into space was obviously uh, not a one-sided thing. It was very much. Uh, a race between the USSR and the United States who could get the first man into space at the earliest possible opportunity. Now, because obviously America being a more sort of open society at this time, there was more information publicly available as to what they were doing and when they were doing it. Obviously not everything was known, but the sort of broad strokes of what was going on were sort of made public, that they were attempting to launch a suborbital Mercury mission in uh, 1961. Now the original plan was there to be four of these suborbital flights, literally just firing the capsule up into a sort of arc that doesn't quite reach orbit but is enough to go into space for a short period, about a 15 minute flight. And yeah, the original plan was to be four of these. Now America only ended up sending two suborbital flights. So they accelerated the program partly because of the Soviet successes in actually orbiting the Earth at the first opportunity. Gagarin's flight was an orbit, what an orbit of the Earth, but there's something that America wasn't yet to achieve until the next year in 1962 when uh, John Glenn became the third American in space and the first one to orbit the Earth. But at this stage of the space race, yeah, the Soviets were very much ahead in pretty much every department and the US wasn't to catch up for a, a, quite a while. Obviously, these sort of things uh, didn't go down well, in, especially in, like, in Congress of the United States, where there was pretty much uproar, like, how did they manage to do this? It's like, aren't we supposed to be better than them? But obviously, it's, it's always more complex than that. I mean, the United States always had a lot more funding for these programs, and comparatively, the Soviet Union had a shoestring budget, but was very efficient uh, in the terms of use of the money that they did have and the facilities that they have. I mean... If you think about it, it is quite remarkable that a society that was devastated by war, with maybe 30 million people killed, only, you know, a little over a decade before this first space flight managed to actually put someone up into orbit before any other nation in the world. And that's a remarkable turnaround by any stretch of the imagination. And part of this is obviously down to their uh, genius head designer, a guy called Sergei Korolev, who many of you may know, may have heard of. But essentially, uh, he was, I suppose, a very similar position in many ways to uh, Werther von Braun was in the United States, but arguably maybe even more so. Possibly Korolev was doing too much. It was too much of a burden on his shoulders. But, you know, they were approximately the sort of lead designers in both cases and the sort of 
yeah, driving force behind their respective uh, space programs, the sort of visionaries, as it were, pushing forward. And um, in many ways, Von Braun had an easier chance because he was allowed to sort of concentrate more on sort of pure design work and obviously some amount of uh, managing engineering projects too. But Korolev had to juggle a lot more in his uh, uh, corner of the world to do all these uh, complex tasks because obviously there was no precedent for any of this and just pure engineering in pure aerospace terms there was literally no precedent whatsoever for any of this everything that designers engineers technicians pilots both sides of the iron curtain were doing was completely unknown all the solutions they came up with were unique it's one of those situations as lots of parts of the cold war is like when i have even if you had like top intelligence on your opponent, like ultimately at this stage uh, you had to go with just your best engineering. You had no other choice because the two approaches were quite different anyway. So uh, definitely a case of the Soviets actually managing to pull off top quality engineering just off their own resources. Even though many may argue that's not a hundred percent true either. Both sides of uh, of the Iron Curtain there was assistance from captured German. Uh, rocket scientists and engineers but the intriguing thing is in the case of the soviets there they did not get the top rocket scientists that uh from the uh, v2 program that america did under the famous or infamous operation uh, paperclip which the uh, scientists yeah the of the v2 were taken out of germany at the end of the war and basically kind of imprisoned pretty much on a u.s army base for about a decade as sort of penance for their their sins as it were working for the nazi regime and to build better rockets for america initially missiles for the army but that changed but as i say the americans had the top designers the top engineers on from that v2 project the interesting thing is the soviet union did get a fair few people also from the v2 project but they weren't the top engineers they were like the mid-level manufacturing and uh you know sort of equipment technicians really and funnily enough that actually was in many ways a bigger advantage than actually gaining all these sort of former german rocket scientists yeah von braun was definitely worth it and so the other designers no doubt about that but especially in the early space race those mid-level manufacturing engineers and technicians actually gave better reliability or helped give better reliability to the components of the Soviet space program that allowed them to l go far ahead of the United States for many years with fewer resources at their disposal and still having to cope with the ruined infrastructure in their country. So in some ways that was an intriguing way. It wasn't obvious on the surface, but a lot of this information didn't necessarily come out until the Cold War had ended and a lot of people could write their memoirs about this sort of stuff. Because obviously a lot of this information for a very long time was considered a state secret. I mean, even Korolev's name was not known for many years after yeah, all this was achieved because um, you know, the Soviet Union was paranoid maybe a little bit too paranoid that he would maybe be assassinated or kidnapped by the West, but that seemed unlikely. Obviously, there was a lot of political and sort of propaganda calculations involved with this too, but ultimately, the Soviets were the first ones to actually reliably put a booster into orbit, or even suborbit for that matter, reliably to actually put a person on top of it, and... Uh, and enough to bring them back safely. I think it has been said many times that Von Braun was a little bit too cautious on the American side in sending someone up into space. He wanted more chimp flights to prove the technology before he was willing to risk a human in the capsule. And that may be true. I mean, according to Shepard and many of the Mercury 7, they had opportunity to launch just before Gagarin did. Even if that was the case, the Soviets would have probably taken the lead in the space race again, so America would have had the initial triumph, but then they just had a couple of suborbital flights. The Soviets were then launched not long afterwards for an orbital flight, which would then, they would have leapfrogged the United States from being nowhere then into the lead of the space race again. So even if the Americans had actually got there first, the Soviets would still have been ahead of them for, the, for years, literally, into the future. So it's all balance, really. I mean, it's about being bold or not being bold sometimes. 
can come out to bite you. Like another example of this in the uh, space of the Cold War was flying around the moon. I mean, there's a possibility, well, a, a, an actual opportunity that Soyuz could have orbited the moon before Apollo 8 did. But Vitaly mission, so if it's not Vitaly, Vasily mission, the uh, success of Korolev as basically head of the Soviet space program was arguably too cautious in actually uh, trying this out, even though his cosmonauts and engineers were more than willing to give this a try. But that's, uh, again, another story for another day. But uh, my plan today is I am going to, when it turns uh, at f 5, sorry, not 5, 6, 0, 7 UTC, which is the same as in-game time, I am going to orbit the Earth at the time that I think the insertion of Vostok 1 happened. So as sort of my own personal tribute here, hence why I'm starting basically over the former Soviet Union. And uh, to sort of ape that orbit as it were as best I can, but yeah, it's crude, but it's uh, the best I can do under the circumstances. And I have a little YouTube video to play as well, which uh, will be cool. It's some of the original footage of the Vostok 1 launch. Uh, with Gagarin and have some footage of him and uh, a few other people involved in the program. Yeah, it's all the original uh, footage in Russian. I do not speak Russian, unfortunately, but those of you who can will no doubt be able to uh, understand a lot more of it than I can. I just read the transcript, so that's the reason I understand what's going on. <laughs> so, how's everyone out there? How's it going? I hope you're all having a wonderful time wherever you are in the world. Today I've decided to use this, the courier. It seemed appropriate somehow. I think it just looked right, you know. I could have used a bulkier spacecraft, but considering that the Vostok 1 was a very small spacecraft, it seems somewhat fitting to have a smaller little spacecraft to uh, to do the job. We have the beautiful planet Earth and its surrounds. Uh, yes. I suppose I'm kind of known in the elite community for these uh, space history things that I do, but <laughs> and uh, expedition organising as well. But I'm happy to talk about space history. I always am, and this particularly is always a moment of great intrigue and drama in the history of humanity, not just the Cold War. Yeah, I argue a lot of the space race, especially the early space race, was a product of the Cold War. Its acceleration was a product of the Cold War. But in the end, you know, it, it did, I think it was good for, for humanity in the way that, you know, America dedicated the Apollo landings to, you know, the betterment of all mankind. To its credit, the USSR did the same thing with putting Vostok up there and Gagarin's flight. And he, he, Gagarin, was always at pains to underline that. I think he personally believed in it very strongly because he always seems like a very enthusiastic man. I see, he toured the world sort of almost endlessly after that, um, you know, visiting so many countries and being a sort of ambassador, I suppose, for the, uh, the Soviet space program as a whole. But yeah, he was never to fly in space again, this being his one and only space flight. I suppose he was considered to be too much of a, a national hero, a national treasure for the Soviet authorities to want to risk again. Even though he was assigned as the backup pilot for uh, Soyuz 1, which uh, tragically resulted in the death of his friend uh, Vladimir Komarov, also from uh, the first group of uh, Soviet astronauts, cosmonauts. So yeah, he was still in the program for many years afterwards, even if he was basically not allowed to fly in space again. Though it does make you wonder why he was saying to a backup crew, especially if they never were thinking of flying him. Maybe they were t kind of toying with the idea at one point, but they never actually followed through with it. But yeah, it's uh, obviously, many of you may be aware, 
Yuri fortunately died uh, a few years later in a, a plane crash. I think he was trying to get recertified as a or as a fast jet pilot because he just I think was bored with not flying that much. He hardly flew planes at all at that point, and being like a trained test pilot and an astronaut cosmonaut, he uh, yeah he wanted some excitement again and. Uh, Unfortunately, as sometimes that has happened in fast jets, there was a an accident and a fatal one at that. And yeah, it's it seems unbelievable. A man of such great achievement could die in such a yeah mundane kind of way. But as anyone who knows about you know fast jets in any air force at any time in in the history of flight, it's uh, it can be a very dangerous profession flying fast jets. But there you have it. Another sort of related irony to the Cold War was the very rocket that fired Gagarin into orbit. And as actually variants of have fired the majority of uh, Soviet cosmonauts ever since, and Russian ones afterwards, is the R-7. Eventually the R-7 Semyorka ICBM, the world's first ICBM. And not a particularly great one for an ICBM because it took so long to fuel, but the irony is that the basis of such a uh, peaceful exploration of space by the sort of Vostok, then Voskhod, and then now Soyuz rockets are all based on the R-7, which was designed as a weapon of mass destruction. But ultimately, Korolev, I think, wanted... He designed this ICBM for the Soviet military, but wanted it to be the basis of an actual peaceful space program. So, you know, he was sort of playing the system in a way to try and get his ideas for space travel to work and uh, that's what happened so a weapon of war was turned into a tool of peace and i'm glad that it was then again it's like that happened in america as well i mean the early uh, space flights were all on converted icbms the redstone rocket for mercury the atlas again for mercury and the titan II for gemini all converted icbms all sort of man rate with a slightly less vicious acceleration so that you know a person wouldn't actually be harmed by the sort of vicious kickback during launch and acceleration into orbit still what I will do is that in the minutes we have left I will show a brief uh, YouTube clip and then can do the countdown. I say the flight would have happened in about will be eight minutes from now, some six decades previously. Uh, bear with me a second as I turn on the video. If everything goes according to plan, ha <laughs> ha.
And there you have it. Yeah, all original footage from uh, the USSR in the early 60s. I've seen it many times, all those clips, but it always sort of fascinates me. There's that sort of, in the sort of look at the body language, it's in combination of nervousness and excitement. I think no doubt anyone would feel uh, in these sort of circumstances, even the most highly trained test pilot is going to be slightly on edge about this whole business because, you know, it's uh, not just flying a new craft, like you'd be flying in, let's say, a new aircraft, but you're flying a whole new kind of vehicle. That's going to be pretty boggling for anyone, no matter how long you've trained for it. There's going to be that slight edge to it. The guy always seems fairly happy. I mean, interesting to see on the bus as well. The other guy in the spacesuit is the uh, backup pilot for uh, the Vostok 1 flight, uh, German Titov, who would actually fly the next uh, Vostok mission and uh, orbit the Earth multiple times, uh, say, setting a new endurance record at that point. And, uh, yeah, you, uh, as you hear the voice of uh, Sergei Korolev uh, at the mission control at this point. Wishing him well. But, yeah, it's the, the whole flight was not a particularly long affair. It only lasted about an hour and a half. But that's all you need to orbit the Earth once and, and return. You see sunrises, sunsets, different parts of the earth. You know, what he always remarked as part of this, as so many people flying to space always do, the, uh, the beauty of the earth, its fragility, the different environments, you know, the jungles, the polar caps, the forests, so on and so forth, the oceans, and how the sheer beauty of the planet and how it needs to be preserved. I mean, no matter what the nationality of the person, cosmonaut, astronaut, whoever, they they all seem to have that in common. That seems to be a sort of universal experience. The idea of sort of, of like human politics and struggle sort of seeming pointless and petty, really. And the you know boundaries between nations dissolving in the face of nature and and really the cosmos itself, because obviously boundaries are sort of political creations of our societies there is no they don't exist in nature in any any real sense but yeah it's the uh such beauty I think is. It's well recreated here in this uh, model of the Earth. You can see so much of it even from this vantage point. You can see Western Europe and North Africa, etc., especially the UK, where Frontier is based, and where I am based, Spain, France, Algeria, Morocco, etc., through North Africa, various Parts you see the Sahara Desert popping up there through some Sudan and Egypt, Sinai Peninsula, across the Levant, across Turkey, across the Caucasus, into uh, yeah the former USSR, Kazakhstan, Russia, Uzbekistan, etc. Right, ready to roll. I am locked on the Earth itself. I will begin the countdown shortly. So it's ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, go. So 
So at this point, 60 years ago, Vostok 1 would have cleared the tower, left the surface of Baikonur, and, and then started its ascent up into space. I'm now engaging a low orbit of my own. I'm going to use Super Cruise Orbit to stabilize it and switch to external view. So you see the various settlements, the various cities of the Earth all lit up. See across the Indian subcontinent, across Southeast Asia, as the night fades and the sun goes behind the planet, across Indonesia, across Australia. Obviously, this is way in excess of the speed that we would all the Earth these days especially <laughs> way in excess of the speed that Vostok ever orbited the Earth. And no doubt what Gagarin saw that day was truly spectacular. We see the night-day terminator line appearing over here, over the Pacific. By this point, the boosters would have fallen away. The four boosters and the formation of the Korolev Cross would have dropped from the Vostok 1 spacecraft. And Gagarin continues his ascent. You see, every, see, every time there's a Soyuz launch these days, the same thing happens because say it's the evolution of the same basic design the R7 and we cross over the Pacific into space above South America see the Amazon basin see the mountains of the Andes see the Isthmus of Panama across the coast of Brazil into the Atlantic. By now, Vostok 1 will be burning on its final stage. Trying to gain the necessary velocity for orbital insertion. Here as we cross the Atlantic, across North Africa, across the Sahara, Seeing the Mediterranean Sea, seeing Europe. So across the Mediterranean, across the Red Sea, the Persian Gulf, into the night day terminator again, over Iran and Pakistan. See the Himalayas, see China, see Burma and Southeast Asia, see the, the way the sun sets there, almost eclipse of the fashion. It's one of the most pleasing things I think in Elite when that happens. You see a world eclipse, even temporarily. Apart from the sounds of the uh, the FSD super cruising, there are any sort of very sort of simple sounds in the background. Continue 
to watch this wonderful spectacular view I would recommend that any of you who haven't got the soul permit to get the soul permit even if it's just to come here and see this to simulate just orbiting our world in this way for you super cruise this is just easier I know a lot of people look down upon doing it but this is one of the reasons I think it's worth having I don't use it all the time in any stretch of the imagination but for certain things I do and this is one of them to observe a, a planet, a body to observe it without having to worry about where I'm going and keeping the orbit uh, sort of even or close to even because you orbit a planet obviously the planet rotates beneath you that's why you see on you know, mission controls a spacecraft we see this sort of wave-like diagram because you don't just orbit the Earth, it moves underneath you, so it is a sort of waveform. And hello to anyone who's just joining us. I am Commander Yannick, and this is the 60th anniversary of Yuri Gagarin's first space flight. The first space flight by a human being. And here we are. Orbiting the beautiful Earth. Should really have turned off um Yeah, I should have turned off lines in this, shouldn't I? But <laughs> it's a bit late for that now. <laughs> oh well, hey ho. You can only just about see them at the edges anyway. See the odd little sort of light over there of the uh, spacecraft also orbiting the Earth at this point. A wonderful feeling it must be to orbit, whether in the ISS or uh, or another spacecraft, really, or a space station. Obviously now we have a plethora of different spacecraft that can do the job. Aside from Soyuz, the most well-known ones are... You know, obviously Crew Dragon. And uh, there is also a, a Chinese spacecraft, which I forget the name of the top of my head. I should really know this, but uh, yeah, it's somewhat similar configuration to Soyuz as well. But uh, yeah, that's still also a viable present day spacecraft. There have been so many missions of those in, in recent times, but yeah, we'll see what happens. But yeah, there's definitely obviously more Soyuz and uh, Crew Dragon missions planned. Obviously, there are other capsules in the works uh, from companies like sort of I think there's a Blue Origin. There's obviously the Orion capsule, which is actually obviously again you know, part of the whole Artemis program. The slightly frustrating thing is that the Orion capsule and service module are complete and functioning. They could be launched any time, it's just the rocket, the SLS isn't ready yet. And it's the complete opposite situation with SpaceX and the, their Starship. Uh, in SpaceX, the Falcon Heavy is ready. It hasn't actually been man-rated yet, but it's ready in terms of it flies at the moment. Man-rating is obviously uh, a little bit of work to be done, but uh, yeah, that's... Uh, the rocket's nearly finished, as it were, space, but the, the Starship is far from finished as... Anyone who's been paying attention to the news has noticed uh, the tests that they have not been going as well as they'd have hoped. But, I mean, I encourage and like all these different projects. I, I think they all have something to contribute to uh, human space exploration and human presence in space. Yeah, I could just watch this for ages. I probably will too. <laughs> uh, how's it going out there, everyone? How are you all doing? Hope you're having a good morning or evening. This is one of the amazing things I see about the present global internet and the elite community as well. It genuinely is a global group of people. If you've never seen Elite before, this is probably a quite a good introduction to it. Because <laughs> it's quite relatable, and this is actually one of the most relatable bits of Elite. It shows off 
the game but also shows in a context that most people will be very familiar with <laughs> just imagine what went through the mind of Gagarin as he left the earth but then as he saw these sights He was the first human to see this kind of this kind of sight. They had this kind of experience. Looking for detail of the Pacific Island to see what kind of detail they've gone down to. I can see New Caledonia over there, so and some other one. Look like maybe the Marshall Islands up there. I can see. Yeah. But then, obviously, following uh, Yuri was so many. Uh, so many astronauts and cosmonauts within quick succession. And since then, obviously, a plethora of different people of all kinds of different backgrounds have gone into space. Uh, mostly under uh, the uh, Russian Federation of the Soviet Union on the Soyuz, by Americans on the Space Shuttle, and uh, now on uh, on the Crew Dragon program as well. See, the unmanned test of Orion, I think, is due in theory later on this year. Obviously, that purely depends on the SLS being actually ready. I think it passed some of its recent test firing, so that's uh, another box ticked along the way of making it viable. I mean, I admit the SLS is not the most modern or efficient of rockets, but if it does the job, then that's the main thing, yeah. And there's a whole political angle, which I won't go into it here, but I'm just talking on a sort of purely technological level right now. Looking to the details of, like, the Sahara, and then I look northwards up, up into Europe, and I see the Alps, and then the mountains of uh, Scandinavia at the spine of Norway. But it's a nice feature you see on Earth-like worlds, and really, as you go into darkness, into dusk, into the night-day terminator, you see all the lights of the cities come on. I think they look like they're broadly accurate, I suppose. I'm not an expert the geography of every single country, but it looks kind of approximately right. Like in uh, China, most of the the lights being in the sort of eastern part of the country, which is about accurate for their population. Um, and with Australia, most of the lights being around the coast. Actually, in this, there's more in the centre than I would have thought, but yeah, so it's supposed to be the far future. So uh, uh, who knows what's happened? <laughs> be an era of post World War Three catastrophe and global warming, so then again, wouldn't Australia be even more of a desert than it is already? I don't know, but that's how things uh, develop. It's almost mesmerizing watching this. I think it's been said by um, various inhabitants of the International Space Station that yeah, they can. There's that little uh, viewing port that they uh, go to in their spare time and just look out the window. And I often describe spending literally hours looking out the window at Earth and also further into space and just seeing what's out there. I mean, we all would do that if we were in the same position, wouldn't we? <laughs> I mean, broadly speaking, I think most they don't people don't tend to play elite unless they have an interest in space, at least a passing interest in it. Oh, 
our world in its glorious detail. By this point of his flight, although 60 years ago, yeah, Yuri would have been well established in orbit. One of the most interesting and maybe slightly alarming for him or the early pilots of uh, of the Vostok program was that the Soviets did not have a particularly good global tracking network at this point. Partly because the whole technology surrounding it was in its infancy. But it's the fact that they hadn't actually got to the point of actually working out how they would track a spacecraft and keep in constant communication with it throughout its journey around the Earth. I think eventually they end ended up deploying a lot of uh, ships at sea in very strategic locations to act as uh, comm ships. I mean, the Americans did similar. The Americans had more ground-based ones comparatively because they had more allies in sort of key places in the world. So he's had allies that they tend to be more clustered in sort of Eastern Europe or in certain parts of Africa. But not so much at the time, though, that could have helped them. So for parts of the Vostok 1 flight, I think Yuri was actually out of comms, direct comms range of the uh, Soviet Union itself. And even through relay stations, it wasn't in contact. I think on Mercury, the uh, astronauts there did also have problems where there were places where they would be out of comms range for a certain amount of time. Even though they did have a slightly better tracking network in terms of where it was... Uh, scattered across the globe. I think for both the superpowers it did improve over time though, once they realised it would be very useful just in case of an emergency to have a way to be in, in contact with uh, the spacecraft at all times. Or if they, yeah, if during a silent period, let's say the crew was supposed to be sleeping, if there was an emergency they could raise the ground immediately. I think it took like till quite late in the Gemini program before, let's say, the American one was complete. I, I think the Soviet one was by a similar period of time, uh, at least by the late '60s, anyway. Obviously, these days it's that they've really sort of dispensed with the need for the sort of the ground tracking stations or sea tracking stations uh, by having a series of satellites that are the comms relays uh, for you know space programs generally. Obviously, there's so many satellites out there these days, it's such an easy thing to launch one. It's a very obvious thing to do. Yeah, I'm just taking it all in here. I think all those early space flights, another thing in common from both superpowers is that they were all very risky journeys. I mean, as a booster, the R7 you know, Vostok variant was more reliable than one the Americans were using for, uh, especially for Atlas. I mean, for trying to get into war, but Atlas was, was pretty dodgy, at least to start with. They eventually got it working okay, but it was a pretty fragile machine. Uh, yeah, it's... Um, and there were so many incidents of both um, early Vostok and especially early Mercury flights that the crews nearly died. I think on Yuri's flight particularly, he had a problem with the spacecraft wouldn't com the, the reentry module wouldn't completely detach from the service module, and uh, it looked like a one second he might not actually make it back through because he would be badly positioned for reentry. But it turned out not to be the case, and uh, he's able to separate okay and return unharmed. Right, okay. I think I'll probably be wrapping the stream up in the next five minutes or so. But for those of you interested, I will be having a sort of celebratory gathering of uh, commanders at Dow's Hope in the Fleetcom private group tonight at uh, 
twenty hundred hours UTC in game time. So those of you who wish to turn up and celebrate one, I think a lot of people call this Yuri's night as well, don't they? In uh, in recognition of Gagarin's flight. But this wasn't a night for me. This is quite early in the morning for me, so that's why I'll do another one later on today. But yeah, if you can make it, I'd love to see you uh, in Fleet Combat Dav's Hope at uh, 2000 hours. So until then, fly safe.